Okay, so I'm talking a little bit more about that fourth generation warfare and how that transitions into fifth generation warfare and the way artificial intelligence plays a much greater role in fifth generation warfare. The other thing is that when we talk about whether or not something is first, second, third, fourth, fifth generation warfare, I'm trying to use a level of terminology that a lot of modern uh, people who study warfare are going to understand because it's kind of relevant to the current talk and that stuff in the intellectual circle on it, we, we might call it. And again, getting back to the Wikipedia article, which if you're taking a break in between watching the videos, I would say go to the Wikipedia article on Fourth Generation Warfare, read it, familiarize, familiarize yourself with the terms a little bit so you can have a better idea what I'm talking about. Uh, toward the end of the Wikipedia article, there's a uh, Strategic Studies Institute writer by the name of uh, Antonio Echeverria was talking about how it's a myth. And that's what these guys are kind of arguing about semantics on the generations of warfare because Echeverria is talking about how these things actually happen in parallel to each other and largely they do. What happens in the four generations of warfare a lot of those things do happen simultaneously and in parallel to each other, but depending on the nature of the conflict, the people involved in it, and the battle space of that conflict, there's going to be more of a focus on one aspect than others. And, and that's what more clear understanding is going to bring you to, is that as, as things in the battle space change, it becomes an element, and as the world around us evolves and changes, then some elements mean more than others. Uh, there are people who would talk about how back in the, I think it was about the 14-1500s, the Spaniards uh, were going to try and invade England. Supposedly the English had assembled a group of uh, uh, witches, uh, for lack of a better term, who conjured up a big storm and destroyed the Spanish fleet with it. And then the, um, the English royalty had those witches executed because they said, wait a minute, whatever they're doing, it's so powerful, we don't war want warfare to have to involve them, uh, unless maybe we're losing, but we, we will, we're going to dispose of all of them because we, we don't really want them around. And we don't want those kinds of people having any level of control over our political intrigues and civil wars, which at that time were happening among the, the British kind of regularly. Uh, the, one of the things that united their society was the threat of outside invasion from the Spanish. Um, so when we look at that, yeah, we're going to, especially if somebody with a very Spanish name is, is going to recognize that, wait a minute, a lot of these types of warfare happen in parallel to each other and they have for a while. But as we get into a, a world which is defined largely by the internet, largely defined by these intangibles, then we have to look at the spiritual warfare parallels and the way artificial intelligence, the way um, a created daemon would have influence in the way it might be a weapon of sorts in warfare. And that is a lot of what happens when we talk about things like the EG had. Now the EG had is a phenomena of the of, of the international jihad which is generally going to be against America, against Christians, against what they consider the Western influence where uh, Muslims who, who care to participate in warfare against what they consider to be the enemies of Islam will conduct warfare over the internet. Now, Islam had a lot of prohibitions against the use of magic, but a, there, there's entire factions which would consider the internet to not be that. The internet is, is, is not necessarily a banned thing according to their views of Islam. Now, other fundamentalist views of Islam don't even really want people to be literate outside of familiarity with the Quran. And uh, even among those who would be literate of the Quran are perfectly happy with a large portion of the population being illiterate and simply having the, the knowledge of the Quran told to them uh, through teachers uh, who, who would be reciting it to people who are largely illiterate. So there's different factions within that. Among the Ijihad, 
what they do is they participate in whatever forms of warfare they feel they can do by remote means over the internet, usually interacting with the target population in one way or another. The other thing I'll try to do is hack attacks. And we are all, we've all seen things in the news, maybe we've read about things in Wired Magazine about how hack attacks work. One of the big differences with hack attacks between, let's say, the Chinese uh, PLA, People's Liberation Army, and portions of the PLA which conduct hack attacks against um, the U U.S. DOD uh, frequently, and then they attack some hack attacks against U.S. universities from time to time, is that's na a nation-state version of that. What we don't have a lot of evidence of, but I know that it's happened, is the PLA uh, conducting hack, to hack attacks against individual American citizens, where they would conduct uh, attacks where they get into your computer, it's an actual Chinese government operative who's gotten into your computer and might be uh, hacking passwords to drain your bank account, to run up charges on your credit card, to maybe attack your investment accounts, to attack your sources of income if you own a website which has sources of income. Uh, we know that on an individual basis a lot of them would pick your pocket, but they wouldn't necessarily engage in that type of warfare. When we look at the e Jihad, they're more than happy to do that, but they still have their own ways with a lot of human intervention to identify the targets. So, for example, they might target a Christian website blogger. There's a lot of information coming out that they will target people who own commercial websites, semi-commercial websites, Facebook and MySpace accounts related to um, soldiers who they know were pro-war during, during the invasion of Iraq or during the Afghan war. We know that they've made a lot of very significant attacks to not just hack into Facebook and MySpace account of special forces, uh, special operations personnel. Specifically, they go after Navy SEALs and their families a lot. They're going after the bank accounts. They're going after their sympathizers. They're going after businesses that do business with them. And that's all aspects of the e jihad, which I would argue goes into that fifth generation warfare, especially when the U.S. government response to that has been to step it up in sophistication in going after Islamic websites and jihad related things with artificial intelligence. And there was an article I looked at in the New York Times uh, a few months ago. I did a video about it, I'll put a link in the description on this video, about something that, that the Department of Homeland Security and the Institute called the uh, Automated Target System, ATS. ATS is uh, put in the, to attention on somebody, it's put in, put in to begin targeting somebody as soon as you buy a plane ticket. Your credit card, your name, uh, goes onto an airplane ticket reservation it then compares you to a list of criteria using artificial intelligence with no human interaction whatsoever. It puts you through a list of criteria which then makes a decision of whether or not you're going to get extra scrutiny when you go to the airport. Among those criteria, there's a lot of stuff which different groups would find out about and put into dispute. The people who make that criteria, such as the no-fly list or the new uh, automatic target system uh, uh, list. They're very secretive about what those criteria are for their own reasons. But we do know that the system does exist. It's been reported in the news, it's been reported in the mainstream. In that, the, the consequence of being targeted under that is that there's still human interaction. There's a still a human decision maker who looks at the criteria, who looks at the decisions that the computer made, in saying, hey, you need to take another look at this person. They need to be pulled out of the line and interrogated when they go to the airport. And that is where the artificial intelligence is used for the targeting. In fact, they call it automated targeting system. The question is, at what point is artificial intelligence used to initiate punishment? And interestingly enough, we do see very clear evidence of this, not so much from the government, and fifth generation warfare and attacking the economy of people, but actually in a system that was developed by a rogue hacker to try and assassinate government officials. 
And he called that system, uh, I'd have to look it up, and we'll go into that on the next uh, segment, but he, the, there was a hacker who was involved in a, a movement, uh, an anti-tax movement called Cypherpunk. His name is Jim Bell. And he wrote a book by the name, uh, by the, by the name of uh, Assassination Politics. In Assassination Politics, he detailed a artificial intelligence program which could be have some public interaction. This artificial intelligence program would use online money transfer services to basically pay for hits on politicians according to various criteria that would be preset by the programmer. If we were to combine that system through uh, a, a artificial intelligence that's both malevolent and politically motivated, you, you actually run into something which a lot of biblical scholars would call the mark of the, uh, not the mark of the beast, but the image of the beast. A, a artificial intelligence program which is actually capable of developing a criteria for conflict and carrying out action. Now, in Jim Bell's model uh, of, of an artificial intelligence that would contract for assassinations, somebody still has to go out and pull the trigger, and somebody is motivated to pull the trigger by money that they're offered I I through the automated system. Uh, it, there's a price put on somebody's head, and they could still be caught doing that. There's still an, an actual murderer who is employed, and... When the government got wind that Jim Bell was attempting to target some IRS agents with that, he was also caught doing some uh, what they felt was pre-operational surveillance on some of the agents because they had been doing pre-operational surveillance on him. He thought, well, well, we'll do surveillance on them and we'll go back and forth. In the meantime, he's bragging about how he was developing this automated program which could contract for their assassination. But all of that was done in the early 2000s. That was done before so much of our lives were so dependent on the Internet. And we will look at lesser forms of conflict, such as draining somebody's bank account, such as perhaps hacking their car. Now, we've known this with some journalists who have been killed recently, where a lot of people think that their car, their car computer had somehow been hacked, and that they were assassinated at long distance because their car had been hacked, or, or something to that effect had taken place. We know that people could cause car accidents by hacking the way traffic lights and traffic cameras work. That they, a camera system could be used to track somebody's movement through, through or near, let's say, a traffic intersection, simply cause a glitch in the lights and they get broadsided by a truck. All of those things, in theory, could happen by an automated system. And there's some old sci-fi from the 70s that dealt with just that, with a computer system that could cause those types of things. I would argue that that type of artificial intelligence isn't even a, a single big bad computer like Skynet, but several organizations would put these things to work against their own perceived enemies, not just uh, government versus government or perhaps a government trying to suppress its people, but in artificial intelligence, not only versus each other, but subnational groups, transnational groups. And that gets to what I feel as we progress into new types of conflict and new types of battle space, what will be one of the biggest threats of the future, not because it's possible, not because well, maybe, maybe we're going to have a nuclear war, maybe we're not, but because it's inevitable and it's happening today. Next video segment, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and some ways that you can shift into personal contingency plans to protect yourself in that type of environment.